<laughs> All right, ready, go. Okay, so here we go. We're uh, into, what is this called there, Scott? Uh, well, it's the uh, open forum for the last three classes, but we were gonna show a, a couple, two or three more videos that we didn't get to about osteoporosis last week. Perfect. Okay, that sounds good. And uh, it looks like there may be a, a new player or two here. I don't know. I, maybe it's repeat and I just don't remember everybody. But if you're new to the class, maybe you could kind of unmute yourself and say how you found out about it and uh, what you might hope to get out of it. Um, we're kind of curious about that. You don't have to, but we like it when you do. We know who to thank. Everybody's been here before, huh? Okay. Or everybody's shy, one of the two. Anybody have anything they want to uh, share with the group? I do. Oh, go ahead, Daddy. It, this won't take long. I wanted to uh, tell everyone about a wonderful episode of a new uh, outdoor TV series is it's, I believe it's called America Outdoors with Baratunes Thurston. It might be on uh, Prime. I don't remember exactly where I saw it, but this episode that I saw uh, three weeks ago was on a lake, I think Pekawong Lake in northern Wisconsin. He, this guy, the host, went up there and uh, spent some time with a couple of uh, Native Americans who make a substantial part of their living from harvesting what they call manumen, their name for wild rice. Mm -hmm. uh, northern Minnesota, well, generally the banks of Lake Superior is the only place where this stuff can be found. And as near as I can tell, it's a dang near perfect food. It's uh, relatively high in protein, has no gluten, low in sugar, high in fiber, low in sodium. It's complicated, though, because unless you get, get it like they do, you can't, I'm, I'm not sure you can be totally confident in what you're getting. There are several brands available on Amazon. But uh, one source I saw online, which appeared to be more the 100% the authentic thing called uh, Wild Food Warehouse, <clears throat> it's pretty expensive. You, you have to order it now to get it by October 1st, but 10 pounds will run you $200. That's, that's kind of like an exotic coffee these days <laughs> in price. Wow. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to pass that along. If It'd be well worth your time to uh, take a look at that episode, if you could, because for these people, uh, these Native Americans, it, it goes beyond nourishing the body. For them, it takes on a, uh, a spiritual aspect. They've been doing it for centuries. I actually uh, was watching PBS on a uh, uh, Minnesota the the uh, um, border um, country with Canada, and they did show harvesting of that. I can't remember what the name of it is that you said. But they showed, yeah, how they beat that mm -hmm. into the boat and mm -hmm. uh, harvested. It was kind of interesting. So, how, how do you spell that? M A N O O M I N. Thank you. Okay, thanks for sharing that. Anybody else have anything uh, they want to share? Like I see uh, Rosa. Rosalba. Uh, you can hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, yes, about uh, healthy food, what I can eat. Uh, I have and who, a, like, 
Please. So you're here to learn about healthy food you can eat and who referred you? Who recommended? My doctor. Your doctor? My doctor, yeah. Okay, well, we're happy that you could make it and uh, we'll uh, uh, glad to see you. Keep coming to a cl few classes and uh, we have also these classes that you can kind of listen to um, on our website if you're not familiar with that. That's livelifestylemedicine.com. We might share that with you at some point in the future. Okay. Class tonight. <laughs> Bye. Okay. Uh, anybody else? All right. So maybe we can start out with a video or two. Um, and then we'll kind of see where we go from there. Uh, we want your questions and whatever it might be. So uh, I have. Let's see, four videos that I was going to share, um, possibly. Let me optimize this, and then you should be able to see my desk, right? I, yep. OK, thanks, Scott. And then I'm going to go to the tip group. And we're going to start out with almonds for osteoporosis. Let's check that out. Currently, an estimated 10 million Americans suffer from osteoporosis, causing more than a million fractures, including hundreds of thousands of hip fractures, a common reason people end up in nursing homes. Many older women say they'd rather be dead than break their hip and end up in a home. Bone is a dynamic, living organ that's constantly renewed through a process of remodeling and modeling involving bone breakdown by cells that eat bone, called osteoclasts, and bone formation by cells that build bone, called osteoblasts. Osteoporosis is caused by an imbalance between bone loss and bone gain, most often related to hormonal changes that occur during menopause. Is there anything we can do to help tip the balance back and forth bones favor. There are a number of specific compounds in plant foods that look promising, uh, but that's based on like in vitro studies like this, where they basically drip some plant compound on bone cells in a petri dish, and do see a boost in bone builder cells, or a, a drop in bone eater cells. Uh, but no matter how much people like cranberry sauce, they're not injecting it into their veins. For phytonutrients <laughs> to reach the bone, they first have to get absorbed from the digestive tract into the bloodstream, make it past the liver, before they can circulate to our skeleton. So what would be nice is a so-called ex vivo study, where you take people, feed them a food or not, and then draw their blood a few hours later, and then drip their blood on bone cells and see if there's any difference. But nothing like that had ever been attempted until this study. Normally, I'm not impressed with studies funded by marketing boards who pay for studies like this that found that eating almonds improved cycling distance and athletic performance compared to cookies. But this study was rather brilliant, not surprisingly, <laughs> given it was performed in the world-famous lab of Dr. David Jenkins. There was a population study that suggested that eating almonds could protect against osteoporosis, so what they could have just you know, done is drip some almond extract on bone cells, but that's not testing the whole food. Instead, you could treat bone cells with the blood obtained from donors fed the whole food to directly test the effects of these foods at the cellular level. So, they exposed human osteoclasts, the bone eaters, to blood obtained before and four hours after eating a handful of almonds. Uh, but wait a second, before I get to the results, I mean, if you ate a handful of almonds every day, wouldn't you gain weight that's almost 200 calories? Let's find out. 
If you add a handful, or a handful and a half, like 35 almonds as a snack, in addition to women's regular diet as a mid-morning snack, and then told them, you know, eat as much as you want for lunch and supper that day, people eat less. In fact, so much less, they cancel out the nut calories. Uh, they all had the same breakfast, then zero, 173, or 259 calories worth of almonds as a snack. Then ate as much lunch as they wanted, but the nuts appeared to be so satiating that they ate less for lunch or dinner, such that at the end of the day there was no significant difference in total caloric intake between any of the three groups. Part of the reason people don't tend to gain weight adding nuts to their diet may be because we end up flushing nearly a third of the calories down the toilet because we don't chew well enough. Uh, this is why we think there's so much less fat in our bloodstream after eating whole almonds compared to the same amount of almond oil taken out of the same quantity of nuts, but in oil form. So anyway, they wanted to see if they could suppress the activity of the cells that eat away our bones and they found that blood serum obtained following the consumption of an almond meal inhibits human osteoclast formation and function and gene expression, providing direct evidence to support the association between regular almond consumption and a reduced risk of developing osteoporosis. They also tried before and after eating other meals, uh, rice or potatoes, to make sure it wasn't just some effective eating in general, and no, the, the protective effect did appear specific to the almonds. So, so the take I get on that is, you know, you got to kind of think about what is important in your life. If weight loss is your goal, um, you know, you can eat some some nuts, uh, not too many, but you can eat some and still lose weight. But if you're not getting the goal you want, you can listen to Chef AJ and do no nuts. If you're worried about inflammation, eating walnuts, according to Gregor, they have more um, omega-3 than almonds. But if you're worried about osteoporosis, that's your big worry every night. You're waking up thinking about, am I going to break a hip because of osteoporosis? Maybe you might want to try the almond root. But let's say, is there anything else that you might consider doing? So let's go to the next video, and then we'll see if you have a question. I have two more videos because one is phytates and one is prunes. So. We have almonds, you have that in your brain now thinking, okay, maybe almonds are gonna do the trick for me. And now we're gonna go on to, uh, let's try prunes and then do phytates. We are in an epidemic of osteoporosis. 10 million Americans have it, and one in three older women will get it. We urgently need public health strategies to maintain bone health and prevent osteoporosis. Might fruits and vegetables be the unexpected natural answer to the question of osteoporosis prevention? Evidence from a variety of studies strongly points to a positive link between fruit and vegetable consumption, and indexes of bone health, such as bone mineral density. And the size of the effect in the older women is impressive. Uh, doubling the fruit intake is associated with a 5% higher spine mineralization, in the same relationship with young women too. And eating lots of fruit in childhood may protect bones throughout life, something that was not found for milk intake, as I've explored before. Bone health isn't just about calcium. There are several key nutrients in fruits and vegetables and beans associated with better bone mineral density, but does that translate into lower hip fracture risk? The Singapore Chinese Health Study found that a diet rich in plant-based foods, namely vegetables, fruits, and beans such as soy, indeed may reduce the risk of hip fracture, but why? 
The underlying mechanism in postmenopausal osteoporosis is an imbalance between bone cessation and bone formation, and oxidative stress may play a role in this balance. Uh, there are two types of bone cells, the bone-forming osteoblasts and the bone-dismantling osteoclasts. Osteoblasts are continually laying down new bone, while osteoclasts chisel away old bone, and they use free radicals as the molecular chisel to chip away our bone. Too many free radicals in our system, though, may lead to excessive bone breakdown. Antioxidant defenses appear markedly decreased in osteoporotic women. Elderly osteoporotic women were found to have consistently lower levels of all natural antioxidants tested. Because excessive free radicals may contribute to bone loss, it's important to elucidate the potential role antioxidant-rich fruits play in mitigating the bone loss that leads to the development of osteoporosis. The thought is that fruits upregulate the bone-building cells and downregulate the bone-eating cells, tipping the balance towards greater bone mass. So let's put a fruit to the test. Uh, which one are we going to pick? Well, dried plums were chosen because they have among the highest antioxidant ranking among commonly consumed fruits and vegetables, and because the researchers scored a grant from the California Dried Plum Board. When you think of prunes, you think of bowels, not bones, but over a decade ago, researchers at Oklahoma State tried giving a dozen prunes a day to a group of postmenopausal women, using a dozen dried apple rings as a control. After three months, only the subjects who consumed the prunes had significant elevations in an enzyme marker of bone formation, although prunes didn't seem to affect markers of bone breakdown. So prunes may help more with building bones than preventing bone loss, though the reverse was found with almonds, so maybe a little prune-almond trail mix is in order. While this bump in bone formation indices, one might expect um, with this uh, improvement, uh, one might expect if they did a longer study, we would actually see an impact on bone mineral density. And nine years later, just such a study was done. Twelve months on dried plums versus apples, and both dried fruit regimens appeared to have bone protective effects, though the prunes seemed to work better in the arm, bone, and spine. So the Dried Plum Marketing Board wants everyone to know that dried plums are the most effective fruit in both preventing and reversing bone loss. Uh, but only two fruits have ever been tested, plums and apples. But if this uh, does pan out for other plants, a fruit and vegetables approach may provide a very sensible and natural alternative therapy for osteoporosis treatment, one that is likely to have numerous additional health-related benefits. All we have to do is convince people to actually do it. And that's what we try to do week after week, is try to convince people to actually do it. And so one more video on phytates. Health authorities from all over the world universally recommend increasing consumption of whole grains and legumes— beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils— for health promotion. But what about the phytates? Phytate is a naturally occurring compound found in all plant seeds, so botanically that means all beans, grains, nuts, and seeds. Over the decades, phytate has been badly maligned as a mineral absorption inhibitor. That's why, for example, you hear advice to roast, sprout, or soak your nuts to get rid of phytates, so we can absorb more minerals like calcium. The concern about phytates in bone health arose from a series of laboratory experiments performed on puppies, published in 1949, suggesting high phytate diets have a bone-softening and anti-calcifying effect. Subsequent studies on rats, in which they fed them the equivalent of 10 loaves of bread a day, confirmed phytate status as a so-called anti-nutrient. But more recently, in light of actual human data, phytate's image has undergone a makeover. If you put 
people on a high phytate diet and measure their calcium balance, their bodies appear to become accustomed to the extra phytate over time, and it all worked out. But this study was done on only three people. So I was glad to see this study published, which asked the simple question, do people who avoid high phytate foods, legumes, nuts, and whole grains, have better bone mineral density? No, in fact, quite the opposite. Those that consumed more high phytate foods had stronger bones, as measured in the heel, spine, and hip. The researchers conclude that dietary phytate consumption had protective effects against osteoporosis, and that low phytate consumption may instead be considered an osteoporosis risk factor. This is consistent with reports that phytate can inhibit the dissolving of bones similar to anti-osteoporosis drugs like Fosamax. A follow-up study found the same thing— improved bone density in those that consumed the most phytates. But this is the most convincing study to date, actually measuring phytate levels flowing through women's bodies and following their bone mass over time. And women with the highest phytate levels had the lowest levels of bone loss in their spine, in their hip, and so no surprise that those that ate the most phytates were estimated to have significantly lower risk of major fracture, and lower risk of hip fracture specifically. This is thought to be in part because phytates help block the formation of bone-eating cells in their bone-eating activity. You can see how much more bone is eaten away in the non-phytate group on the left. Now the drug Fosamax can have a similar beneficial effect, but phytates don't have the side effects associated with this class of bisphosphonate drugs— side effects like osteonecrosis. There's a rare side effect associated with this class of drugs called osteonecrosis of the jaw. And the whole reason people take these drugs is to protect their bones, but by doing so may also risk rotting them away. So now you have it. What is it that you have? <laughs> um, it's sort of what we've been talking about in most every class. Uh, if you want to help os uh, osteoporosis, what is it that you may want to consider eating? Whole plant foods. Which groups? Uh, legumes, that's the beans and lentils, and uh, all fruits, all vegetables, and whole grains. Uh, that's exactly what Dr. Greger is recommending, and maybe some nuts and some nuts and seeds. So, if you not only are concerned about other diseases in your life, like heart disease, diabetes, cancer, what do you want to eat? Same plant foods. Uh, the message should be getting to be very familiar with some of you, except for maybe the new people. And I Any think thoughts? And what, I, and what I want to say is it's always a great example of, of the reductionism versus holism aspect. So, you know, we focused on phytates and we focus on, you know, the specific chemicals and different things. We study them to figure out, well, why, you know, why is it that this is it this that this particular chemical is in the food is is causing the the benefit or is responsible for the benefit or is it the whole food and what the theme is over and over it's it's interesting to to learn about the mechanisms and sometimes we get good answers with with some of the details of the different chemicals and substances within foods but what, what it always comes back to this is the beauty the beauty and simplicity of just eat the food because just like like with the phytate example we it's like, okay, well, phytates block calcium absorption. So how come high phytate diets lead to, to less osteoporosis and better bone health? Well, because the body's not dumb. The body knows how to, you know, it's basically the phytate itself. It wasn't the key feature. It, it's basically the food is the key feature and the, the body's not dumb and it knows, okay, it's gonna, it blocks the osteoclast. So it blocks the bone degrading chemical and then you, the body kind of compensates over time eating high phytates to not block the absorption of calcium. But so it's just a good example of, you know, even if you got lost in the weeds there on the, on the phytate video, just remember that, oh, 
foods that are high in phytates are associated with less, with better bone health. So, and then also better reduced risk for heart disease and diabetes and cancer, as you mentioned. So just kind of a good example of the, of that reductionism with the details versus the holistic approach to, to, to nutrition. Any thoughts from anybody else? I have a question there. Yes. Go uh, ahead. Would, would drinking almond milk have the same effect as eating whole almonds? I, my guess would probably it'd be probably not, just because you're losing some of the some of the whole food there. But uh, I don't know if they haven't studied. You'd have to do a study to to compare it. But uh, my guess is probably wouldn't have the the same effect. I would guess the same as Scott. Having made almond milk myself, you take the almond, you grind it up, uh, you can take a nut bag and squeeze out the liquid. And what do you leave behind? You leave behind the fiber. Uh, you leave behind uh, many probably of the nutrients. And so uh, that fiber is extremely important in our life. It's the food that your microbiome needs to eat. You know, if you starve your microbiome, they don't feed you back. So, Marsha, you raised your hand. Yes. Will a cheesecloth work the same? Will what? Will a cheesecloth work? A cheesecloth? Yes, a cheesecloth will work. If okay. you want to grind the almonds uh, and you just uh, pour them through the cheesecloth and you squeeze it out, and uh, you get almond milk without the preservatives. In my experience, it lasts about five days to a week in the refrigerator, although we usually drink it up every, we, we're doing soy now, but when we did almond, it's usually three or four days is how long it lasted. Okay, thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. Anybody else? All right, I'm gonna, we're going to go back to the room here uh, and see who, if anyone has their hand up or anybody has a question. Lead on. Just unmute yourself and ask away if you like. Charlie, um, this is Evie here. Doug said that he spoke with you last week and there was a, a video that you knew of that talked about DEXA scans and some of the fallibility of those that if I was interested in seeing that, that you could forward the information to me. Uh, we can not only forward it, we can play it now and discuss it. How's that? That'd be wonderful if other people are interested. I think they probably are. Uh, what do you think, Scott? Yeah, it's eight minutes. We have the time, I think. You bet. All right. Well, let's go to DEXA scans. Are they useless for determining bone health? Let's listen to what Pam Popper has to say. And then uh, you can make your decisions, discuss with your doctor uh, who's ordering these tests as to whether you think it's appropriate or not, and that sort of thing. This is on YouTube. Uh, it's DEXA scans. It says useless for determining bone health. Let's see what it says. Hello, everybody. This particular video that I'm making right now is a remake of a video that I did about three weeks ago. And I had out of the whole video clip one erroneous line, but it was an important one, important enough that I thought it was good to retape the video. So here is the second redo on DEXA scans, useless DEXA scans. Bone is living tissue and constantly remodels. Bone mineral density peaks during the reproductive years of women and then begins to decline during menopause. In other words, loss of bone mineral density is a natural result of aging. Osteoporosis is a condition in which bones become weaker and more brittle and therefore more subject to fracture. This is distinctly different from normal age-related loss of bone mineral density. Women in westernized countries are told that osteoporosis is an epidemic we call everything an epidemic here in this country, and therefore a screening is necessary in order to catch the disease early and treat it before the bones start to break. The most commonly used screening tool is dual energy x-ray absorptiometry, or DEXA. 
But the problem is the test results from DEXA are based on a comparison of the individual's result to healthy young women, not necessarily compared to you when you were a younger woman. Most people think that the test is reliable and based on scientific evidence, but it's not true because in fact the main reason why DEXA scans even became widely used was not based on scientific evidence, it was based on the marketing efforts of Merck, one of the companies that makes drugs to treat osteoporosis. Every time I tell these stories, just you'd think that this stuff would not happen anymore, but it does. So here's the story of how DEXA became such a big deal. Fosamax, made by Merck, was the first drug in a category called bisphosphonate drugs, which were developed for the treatment of osteoporosis. The drug didn't sell well. The reason was at the time that it was introduced, women were not diagnosed with osteoporosis until they experienced a fracture, which was not a common occurrence. In order to transform Fosamax into a blockbuster drug, Merck needed to change the way that osteoporosis was diagnosed. So the company, with the cooperation of a panel convened by the World Health Organization, invented the idea that loss of bone mineral density was a sign of disease, not aging. The change was significant because we're all getting older, so it meant that sooner or later we could all be diagnosed with it. At the meeting where this was decided, an arbitrary level of bone density loss was chosen to define the disease. The panel also had a discussion and determined that patients who were borderline would be labeled as having a newly made up condition called osteopenia or pre-osteoporosis. We have pre-diseases for everything now. It's a way you can drug more people. The major problem with this is that bone mass does not produce the risk of fracture. For example, the incidence of fracture in Asian women is much lower than Caucasian women who have relatively higher bone mass. A study including 840 women aged 35 to 75 years of age from five rural counties in mainland China showed that almost all of them over the age of 50 had bone mass lower than the fracture threshold set for American Caucasian women, but almost none had signs of osteoporosis. Less than 4% of them had fractures during their lifetime. Researchers who looked at records for over 2,000 cases of fracture concluded, quote, we do not recommend a program of screening menopausal women for osteoporosis by measuring bone density. Nonetheless, in the pursuit of profits, Merck set out to make testing bone density both easy and inexpensive. At the time, diagnostic equipment for osteoporosis was very expensive and most doctor's offices did not have this type of equipment. So Merck purchased a medical device company, subsidized the manufacturing cost, and developed leasing programs so that every doctor's office and health facility could afford to have one machine. And so that's why you see DEXA scans free at health fairs and all that sort of thing. It made it really, really cheap. The company also mounted expensive advertising campaigns to warn women of their risk and also to convince doctors that women need to be screened with a baseline screening at the age of 50. Merck's lobbyists pressured Congress to mandate that Medicare reimburse for the scans, which paved the way for payment from all third-party payers. The diagnosis of both osteoporosis and osteopenia, of course, increased as a result. Fosamax became a blockbuster. Lots of other drugs were developed and released uh, and approved by the FDA to treat pre-osteoporosis and osteoporosis. The fact remains, however, that DEXA scans are inaccurate. In addition to measuring a marker that has little to do with bone strength, several factors can influence test results, which include the particular manufacturer of the machine, the tech operating the machine, the clothes the patient's wearing, movement during the scan. The variability ranges five to 6%, even if you get everything right. Now, it's a variation that is much bigger than it seems on the surface because changes in bone growth and remodeling are measured down to hundreds or thousands of a decimal point, so the margin of error can represent up to 10 years of aging and bone loss. In one study, bone specimens that had been immersed in hydrochloric acid solution to specifically to degrade bone mineral density were then tested using DEXA. The researchers reported that the bone density of the specimens changed much more than reported by the scans. To illustrate the unreliability of DEXA, a New Zealand television show sent a 50-year-old woman to be scanned by two different brands of DEXA machines. She was slightly below normal when tested by one machine, and when tested by the other was told the results, results were so far below normal that she had osteoporosis and needed to begin a medi uh, taking medication immediately. The bottom line is that the scans are useless and most diagnoses are false. Since people have been trained to think that screening for all conditions is the best path for, best path for preventing uh, disease or death, a lot of people ask me, well, if I'm not going to have a DEXA scan, what should I do? Well, there aren't any effective screening tools for osteoporosis and for most things at this time. Plus, you, 
The screening programs for almost everything except cervical cancer have been a dismal failure in terms of preventing bad things from happening. So there are ways to improve and maintain bone health, and that's what we should be teaching people to focus on. Instead of eat, drink, and be merry, have a DEXA scan and take Fosamax, how about you work on bones and preserving your skeleton, which was designed to last as long as you do, by the way, by doing the right things. So what are the right things? Well, first thing is diet. A low-fat, plant-based diet is better for preserving bone density, while a diet high in animal foods promotes loss of bone density. All right, so the right diet helps a lot. Exercise stimulates bone remodeling and leads to higher bone density. The more muscular you are, the less likely you are to develop osteoporosis or have broken bones. Body strength. A study published in the British Medical Journal showed that the risk of fractures could be predicted with, the, with an accuracy of 96% in men and 93% in women using factors such as body sway and muscle strength. Gastrointestinal health. A healthy gastrointestinal tract allows for the absorption of bone building nutrients including calcium from food. And then sunshine. Promotes the production of vitamin D, which is actually a hormone, not a vitamin. I have to throw that in every time I, the words come out of my mouth. But supplements are not a substitute and are useless for improving bone health. You actually have to go out in the sun. And then some pharmaceutical drugs like corticosteroids are um, thin out the bones, so be very careful about pharmaceutical drugs and discontinue those that you can. If you have already lost an abnormal amount of bone density due to any of the factors that I mentioned here, Remember that bone is living tissue. I think there's a big misunderstanding that some people have that like you, by the time you're 18 or 21, your skeleton is the same and it stays that way until you die and that's not true. It remodels constantly. So you can build bone density by paying attention to the things that I just told you. Um, the drugs typically used to treat it are useless. You can see articles on this in the health library, health briefs library. Um, they're useless and harmful and they actually cause some of the problems that they're supposed to prevent, like fractures. Nothing like taking a drug to prevent fractures that causes fractures. Good reasons to pay attention to the diet and lifestyle factors. Okay, hit the subscribe button if you're not a subscriber. Pass this on to anybody else who you think might enjoy watching it. I'll be back to you next week with more news. So who is this Pam Popper lady who is, uh, <laughs> um, you know, telling you that most of the screening exams done are are not so great. If you've looked at uh, Gregor's site uh, and watched some of his videos on mammograms, you'll, you may be surprised to learn that mammograms do not actually prolong life. They may pick up a number of uh, problems, but the side effects connected with the treating those problems kind of counterbalance the benefits of picking up some issues. And so uh, it's kind of altered my thinking a bit about that. Colonoscopy, I think, is a screening exam. She mentioned cervical cancer screening as being beneficial. I think colonoscopy has been demonstrated to, to um, be beneficial and, and improve health. Um, but most of the other the routine tests, even like a PSA, um, uh, checking for prostate cancer in men, uh, is a very debatable topic now in terms of the benefit for individuals and, and people have to decide what, what their health goals are and, and what they want to live with. And it's a similar thing now with DEXA scan. She kind of indicated a number of reasons why you might not want to get a DEXA scan. And that will have to be measured against your doctor telling you, I think you should get a DEXA scan because that's how, what the standard of care is in our country right now, is to follow people with DEXA scans and, and use that as a standard measurement. And there, most doctors are, are kind of on that track. So I don't know exactly where that leaves you, maybe with a little more confusion than you had before you started, but maybe you could just uh, ask your doctor to take a look at Pam Popper's uh, video. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of uh, controversy about screening tools. Just you know, that's it's always been that way. Because if you look at the, there's a, lot, a huge variation in guidelines around the world. So it's you know, if you just follow the standard of care in America, it's we're pretty. You know, I've learned this. I've been in medicine for for 17 years now. And so it's like you know, the, the train's ro roaring down the track and it's hard to 
put the brakes on or change change tracks it's you know it's the momentum of the medical field is 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 barreling down the track and so it's you know the standard of care in america is very pro procedure pro pharmaceutical you know whereas if you look at you know guidelines you know united states even the united states preventive services task force is a little bit a little bit uh, more conservative looks at the science a little bit better than say some of the other, you know, or just organizations that, you know, pharmaceutical sponsored organizations and, you know, American Cancer Society and different ones that have a lot of, you know, money in the game. It, that's, those guidelines are quite a bit different than what you see from the Cochrane collaboration, the Nordic Cochrane collaboration out of the Scandinavian countries. You look at just the, there's guidelines, evidence-based guidelines from lots of different organizations throughout the world. And there's a huge difference in what they recommend. Uh, as far as different screening tools, but I think you, you Charlie, summed it up well with the ones that are still have some pretty decent evidence behind them, being you know cervical cancer, colon cancer, but yeah, a lot of debate about PSAs and DEXAs and uh, mam mammograms and uh, just to name a few there. Any thoughts from anybody else? Thanks, Scott. Yeah. And like we talk about all the time, these are diet and lifestyle related diseases that we're talking about. So it's not like, I, I guess I would say one thing that maybe you could say is positive out of a DEXA if somebody says, hey, and you know, I get patients all the time that, that come to me and say, yeah, I, I have osteoporosis on my DEXA, but I don't want to take these medications. They're expensive. They have a lot of side effects. What can I do? And then that's a perfect opportunity for me to dive in and talk about diet and lifestyle. So then they, at least they feel like they have some power and some control over it. And it's like, yeah, this will, this could improve your bone health and reduce your risk for fractures, but it also will reduce your risk for heart disease and diabetes and cancer and, and help you get to a healthy weight and all, all the above. Whereas the drug is going to have side effects and it's only going to target that one thing, you know, taking Fosamax isn't going to isn't going to improve, reduce your risk for heart disease or cancer or diabetes or anything else, whereas the diet and lifestyle will. Abby and Doug, you got your hand up. Uh, did that cause you more confusion or what? Uh, uh, two things. You always talk about uh, women having osteoporosis like men never have it. You know, I'm diagnosed with it with a DEXA scan, so I don't know. The other thing is a little anecdote. Uh, a really close friend of ours recently passed away. He's probably rolling over in his grave knowing that we're watching this because he was the regional sales manager for, for LA uh, for Merck Company. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he probably is. If he's wa tuning in, yeah. he's like, uh oh. Uh, caught. So, um, all right. Marsha. Uh, is this DEXA test something like bone density test? Yes. Okay. That's exactly what it is. Uh, okay, because I had that done uh, four or five years ago, I think, something like that. Okay. And I, at that time, they said my bone <clears throat> pretty and not a chance of um, breaking anything. So, so it sounds like you were okay. Yep, I was. Okay, good. Okay, Van, and then uh, Abby and Doug, you still, you, we'll, we'll get back with you. Van? I had a terp, and, you know, my PSA went, <clears throat> went way down. And also the free, what's the free part of free PSA is quite high, and that, that's a very good thing, they say, and that's an indication that, you know, that's a, <laughs> kind of a, a good thing as far as they, you know, prostate cancer occurring. So I wonder, you know, I'm 69. I wonder maybe I should just quit getting the test, the PSA. Well, this is something that you really need to talk with your doctor and urologist. It's not something that in a community class like this, we can make a decision about a PSA. It's a very personal decision. All of us have different uh, risk levels. We have different concerns, uh, different beliefs. 
And uh, I find myself stumbling over my words whenever I'm counseling a patient about whether to do a PSA test or not. Um, I, for okay. myself, I, for myself, I, I'll go five years and not do it. And then maybe something will convince me to do a test just for the curiosity of it. But then I get nervous. What's it going to show? And it always shows low. Yeah. So, so yeah. it's, I probably should just give it up for myself, but I don't know. I've been indoctrinated in a lot of medical techniques and it's hard to just give it up. And I understand that for a number of people, a number of patients that they have a thought process that you go to the doctor, they do a test and they tell you whether you have the disease or not, but it really is not that easy. Hey, thanks. You're welcome. Uh, Abby, Doug. Uh, two things. Uh, uh, we have Kaiser Healthcare. I'm 78 some years ago. I noticed that Kaiser had stopped taking my PSA. I don't know if the cutoff was around 70 or something like that. They discontinued it. Uh, the other thing, I, for Asin's disease, I take 7.5 milligrams of prednisone and 0.1 of fludrocortisone. And that, is that just replacement therapy? And I don't have an increased uh, risk of uh, 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 osteoporosis? Or uh, do, do I have an increased risk or do you know? That is an excellent question, which I have given uh, zero thought to in the past. So I, I really don't know. I don't know, Scott, if you've run into that before, but I, I do know that people who are on long-term cortisone therapy are, are, do, are at risk. The question is, is if you're just replacing the amount that you actually are deficient in, would that put you at decreased risk? And my guess would be no, but how do you know the exact amount that you should be having? Yeah. There's a certain yeah. amount of guesswork as to how much you need. Are you getting an under amount? Are you getting too much? Is it, is it the exact right amount? That's something that I don't know if anyone knows the answer. Maybe your endocrinologist. What do you think? Scott? Yeah, I was just going to say, it'd be a good question to ask the endocrinologist. The only exa other example I could give though, however, that I do know the answer to is people that, men that are low in testosterone, hypotestosteronism, hypoandrogenism, and they take exogenous testosterone, so testosterone replacement therapy. I do know that uh, uh, testosterone replacement therapy, even if you are deficient, does put you at higher risk for prostate cancer. So that's why it's recommended every, every man that's on testosterone replacement, it's recommended that they get a PSA once a year because it does increase the risk for prostate cancer. And that's even with, if you're deficient. So something to do with it's, a, it's coming from an outside source versus when it's just coming from within mm. your body. But I, if that relates, if that's the same way, we do know that chronic steroids do increase your risk for osteoporosis, but if you're deficient because of, of uh, uh, I think he said he has Addison's, uh, yeah. um, I, don't, I guess it would be a, an, I, I would ask that, to, uh, that of an endocrinologist to see if they know. I have an annual checkup in a month or two. I'll get back to you, see what he says, if he knows or not. We're curious. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they have a subset of patients where, where they've been treated for Addison's disease. And did those people develop osteoporosis higher than the average population? Someone yeah. probably has that. I have two things. Yes, uh, Eddie. One is just briefly, I, I wouldn't presume to say that your doctor is incorrect in prescribing prednisone, but that, if you want a horror story, read the list of side effects that drug has. Um, the main thing I wanted to say, though, about bone health is I haven't heard anyone say anything about uh, exercise. I think it's a common misconception that you can't strengthen your bones like you can muscles through exercise, but you can. Last I knew, there was quite a bit in the literature on the value of weight-bearing exercise uh, as it relates to strengthening bones. I don't know if that has changed. It hasn't changed, you're correct. And if uh, Pam Popper did mention exercise, 
Uh, and she did mention Wade Barron. We, we talked about that last week, um, that it is important and it's probably more important than a lot of other things that we've been discussing. But um, uh, we appreciate those comments and, and uh, reinforcement that that's one area that I think most people fall down upon. They, they tend to kind of think about what pill can I take rather than how can I exercise and improve my bone health with so, resistance and weight bearing. So is biking, biking considered weight bearing? No. No. If you go uphill all the time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I would say when I'm going up a steep hill and I'm out of the saddle really grinding, I would say that's becoming weight bearing. But uh, but yeah, usually you say, you know, bicycling and swimming and things like that are not weight bearing. So it's something that's impacting your skeleton. So walking, running, hiking, gardening, you're out moving your body around with, uh, with the force of and then using your muscles. That resistance is important, too. So because that's putting stress on the bone and causing the bone to become stronger. And then having more anything that's building more muscle too. So having more muscle mass. Think of those kind of as a muscle gets stronger and bigger, it put it pulls the tendon pulls on the bone more. And the more with each muscle contraction and that that stress of the tendon attached to the bone is what causes the bone to get stronger. So that's uh, that's why when people like astronauts when they're out in space, right? When they come back, they actually have bo have significant bone thinning when astronauts are up on the International Space Station and they come back because they haven't had that effect of gravity on their skeleton. So their bones get really weak. We haven't talked a lot about vitamin D. Any questions on that from anyone in the audience as to how you're getting your vitamin D, uh, how much to get, how to follow it, those sorts of things. Anybody? Everybody knows what to do. Or you're afraid to ask. <laughs> Could be any one of those, yes? If, you, if you're taking a supplement, is that as effective in absorbing it as, as, as eating, uh, consuming it in food? If you believe everything Pam Popper has to say, no, you have to get vitamin D from the sun. I don't necessarily subscribe to that. And uh, a number of the people who we follow uh, think that taking supplements is uh, the adequate thing to do. Uh, getting the sun is the cheapest thing, but then there is that concern about skin cancer. So you don't want too much sun. So for those people who have really um, uh, are very um, have a little color in their skin and are at higher risk of developing melanomas and the other skin cancers, uh, they may choose to do the supplement route as opposed to the sun exposure. But, um, you know, I think McDougall thinks sun exposure is the ideal way. Um, but other people say doing the supplements is fine. So uh, I guess we'll know in a few years what the definitive answer to that is. I personally take uh, 5,000 units in the winter and I take 2,000 in spring and fall. And in summer when I'm out in the sun a lot, I don't take any or I may take 1,000. So I kind of adjust it that way, but I've monitored my vitamin D level uh, through uh, kind of like online testing, however accurate that is. And the levels were really adequate for what I'm, for the amounts I'm taking. Dr. Greger recommends 2,000 international units a day for everybody who lives in Oregon. Just because we cover our skin up a lot these days, we don't show a lot of skin, so we're not producing a lot of vitamin D even if we were in the sun. And um, he seems to feel that's an adequate amount. Although I must say some people who are overweight, let's say uh, they tend to need more uh, vitamin D. And so 2,000 may not be enough. So if um, you have any concerns, it would be probably worth getting a vitamin D level 
And if you were diagnosed with osteoporosis, uh, Medicare or uh, your insurance should pay for that. If you don't have a diagnosis like that, then it'll be out of your pocket is uh, what one of the problems is. Scott, do you have anything to add or subtract from that, Paul? No, that's that's good. That's, um, I think, yeah, you've summed it up well, but uh, yeah, it's not the insurances aren't wanting to pay for it unless you have a diagnosis of, of low vitamin D. And then the other thing I'd add to it is that the different levels. So if you if your vitamin D level is greater than 20, so the normal le level is 30 is above 30. And so with bone health, if you are as long as you're above 20, that will that will prevent 97.5% of all bone related fractures, osteoporotic related bone you know, fractures is just being above 20. Now, as far as, you know, some of the studies that are out on immune health and some of the other uh, health benefits of vitamin D, which were a lot of studies are, have been done. It's kind of been a hot top, topic in research. Uh, more ideal is above 30 and maybe even as high as 50, but you, know, you don't want to really be any higher than 50. I think it, some people are between 50 and 80 is considered safe, but you don't really want to get too much higher than that because there can be some toxicity. But uh, but if you listen, if you look at uh, you know McDougall and some of the others, they're not, I guess even Clapper too, they're not really convinced on a lot of the, they think this, the studies aren't super definitive and there's still some debate about what's the ideal level. But uh, I think we could all pretty much agree that you know, try to get at least 15 minutes of sun exposure a day. That would probably, mo most people would be above 20 with that. And that's all you really need for bone health. But if you are um, want to be a little bit higher, because there is some research that being higher than 30s may be beneficial, then and maybe like Charlie and I take a, a little supplement. Yeah, I, I tend to take 2000 international units a day, uh, most, you know, most of the year, but in the summer, I don't, I, if I skip a few days here and there, I don't really worry about it because I'm out in the sunshine, but uh, yeah. Don't we uh, absorb uh, less as we age from the sunlight? Um, I'm not really sure. The answer I'm not sure of that either, that we absorb less. Um, uh, I, I guess we'll have to do some more reading on that. The, the, the darker your skin is, the less you absorb. I know that. But uh, so that's what, you know, if you're darker pigmented skin, you got to be in the sun longer to get the same amount of vitamin D. So the, so I think it's something like, I can't remember the exact number, but if you're fair skinned and you're out in the sun for 15, 20 minutes on a hot summer day and your skin just starts to get a little bit pink just from that, that that's something like, 50,000 international units or something, you got a big, huge dose like that. And then, um, and so it's, and it's fat soluble vitamin. So, so you, it, uh, you know, or it's a, technically a hormone, like, like you heard, but, um, but it's a huge dose that you get just from that 15 minutes. So definitely getting that 15 minutes is usually enough, but like Charlie said, we, most of the, a lot of the year where we have lots of clothing on and we're not really out in the sun long enough to maybe get an adequate dose. So that's why we might need the supplements. Here, I did a Google research and it says aging reduces vitamin D production in skin. There's a decrease in concentration uh, in the epidermis in old compared with young individuals, reduced response to UV light, resulting in a 50% decrease in the formation of pre-vitamin D3. So that was uh, from April, 2013. And I, I haven't seen any other studies. So you definitely might be right on that. Thanks for bringing it up. All the more reason to take 2000 international units a day. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I have a question. Yes, Beth. Um, I work with two-year-olds and um, parents of children who have dark skin like African-Americans, um, they will say, oh, my child doesn't need sunscreen. And, you know, we usually put sunscreen on the children. And so is that true? No, they can, dark skin can still get skin cancer from overexposure. So yeah, it's, uh, they should still wear, well, I talked to any dermatologist, they should still wear sunscreen. Yeah. Well, that's what I thought, because I remember researching it a few years ago. And so it's sort of challenging i mean i guess we'll, we do what the parents ask but um 
but if they don't have the right information, it's a little challenging. <laughs> uh, we you know, know about challenging with the wrong information. Right. Thank you. Especially with food. Does anyone have also have any questions about the food label reading I did a few weeks ago and Alzheimer's as well? We could talk about those things too if you don't have any more oste you know, osteoporosis related questions or any question that you might have. It doesn't have to be about just those topics. Next week, we're gonna talk about chronic kidney disease. This is uh, neither here nor there, but just a tiny bit of humor. I worked in health statistics for the state of Missouri for a number of years. And one of the functions of our department was uh, medical and health professional licensing. So we got to see the names of all the uh, licensed providers in the state. And there happened to be an osteo doctor named bone breaker <laughs> <laughs> bone breaker that's pretty cute uh, um a little humor to the classes is always good my father was a feral meat inspector and his name was ham <laughs> <laughs> and he took a he was a, a deputy regional manager of LA area. He took a new employee out to a plant to introduce him. And uh, the man's name was Bacon. And the superintendent <laughs> didn't believe him. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's pretty cute too. Uh, a lot of humor around if you look for it. Uh, so now that we have a few minutes where no one has any questions, I just want to share with you um, a video that I watched this morning and it kind of blew me away and so I shared it with the class this afternoon and I want to share it with you all right now. I want to take you to, um, where am I taking you? I'm going to take you to YouTube and uh, at YouTube we're gonna take you to Kelly McGonagall. McGonagall. So uh, we're gonna do a search for Kelly McGonagall and it's on willpower. A lot of people have trouble with their willpower. Um, and I must tell you, I was just fascinated by listening to what she had to say. Here's the video. I think you can all see it here. It's called The Willpower Instinct, Kelly McGonagall uh, at uh, Talks at Google. And it's a 54 minute video uh, that is well worth your time uh, if you're having trouble um, with uh, procrastination, with trouble with eating foods that you know are not healthy for you, trouble with your willpower. Uh, she gives you several things to think about. This was a TED talk of 10 years ago, or not a TED talk, a Google talk. And uh, I just wanna highly recommend it to all of you, uh, The Willpower Instinct. Um, she has a book on it and um, She's fun to listen to. The science she shares is fascinating. And uh, it just may change your thought process and allow you or others that you know to obtain success that they haven't been able to achieve uh, with, with what you've been trying so far. She has yeah, some she's new a, ideas. Go yeah, ahead. She's a, she's a health psychologist at Stanford and she's the one that we shared the make, how to make stress your friend. She's the same psychologist for that. And I have that, that particular video posted on our website under videos, the one on make stress your friend. 
but that's a yeah that, i'll have to check that one out i haven't seen that one check this one out scott you're gonna probably put it on the site because it's it's uh, kind of closes the loop a bit uh with uh, you know we talk about doing motivational interviewing to help people make changes and stuff but she also has some other thoughts which are well worth the time i know you're always sharing these videos with me uh and occasionally i have to do a little give back yes <laughs> sounds good all right um any other thoughts for the class for today uh, because, you know, we don't have to keep you here all night long. Uh, Doug and Evie oh, and Beth, let's see. Let's do J Doug, Evie first, then Beth. Uh, you know, I was listening to Dr. Esselstyn's talk. And uh, do you uh, go along with everything he has to say? Or do you think he goes overboard in any areas? Well, when I, when Christine and I, uh, 10 years ago, uh, 10 and a half years ago, heard about Esselstyn's study, we read his book and we followed it to the letter. We did not eat nuts and seeds except for a tablespoon of flaxseed a day. We didn't eat avocados, we didn't eat olives, we didn't eat any processed foods. He called me up personally, talked to me, we did this for two straight years. We were like, towed the line completely because we were concerned about uh, the you know Christine's dad dying at 41 of his heart attack and Christine's mom having had a bypass her brother had a bypass and she was next in line and we were convinced that we needed to do something drastic so we didn't think that was extreme but after two years we were feeling good and we then started to incorporate a few a quarter cup of nuts uh, listening to Gregor we incorporated uh, you know, eating occasional olives, like eating occasional avocado. Um, and we've been fine uh, for the last eight years. That's our personal experience. If someone is having chest pain and they're already thinking about going having a, a stent placed or a bypass, I would tell them Esselstyn is the one you should follow 100%. Start it tonight. You don't you know, pass, go, whatever it is, go directly to jail, you know, just do it. Um, and if you have someone who has diabetes, who, you know, is at risk of losing a toe or whatever it is, I would say, follow Esselstyn. If you're not trying to reverse heart disease or reverse diabetes or autoimmune disease, maybe cutting back a little and not being quite as strict may be okay. Uh, but if you have some severe kind of illness, I would do it for two, three years to really clean your arteries and really build your health and then gradually get back to a less strict regimen. So that's my personal thought. How about you, Scott? Yeah, I agree with that. And I mean, you could you could say, even though Esselstyn's is, if it's totally focused on his protocol is totally focused on heart disease and reversing reversing it and opening up the, the the arteries and things like that whereas you know uh it's if you're looking at diabetes you know it's like the mastering diabetes plan it's pretty close to what Esselstyn's advocating for too you just there'd be some subtle differences you wouldn't necessarily have to do you know a cup of green leafy six times a day like like Esselstyn wants to if you're trying to reverse diabetes you know, but there's some subtle differences about what the emphasis is but the, it's all still 100% whole food plant-based eating so it's a so you're on the same track there if you if somebody was following Esselstyn's plan they would likely reverse their type 2 diabetes as well but uh but the focus with that, like certain things, like the six six servings of the leafy green leafies a day at different times, is is more. That's not so much focused on reversing diabetes, but it's it's getting that nitric oxide to bathe your arteries to reverse that plaque and open up the arteries. So so there is a few subtle differences there, but but it is still overall whole food plant based 100%. And I agree, doing it going all in if you have heart disease and autoimmune disease diabetes you're on you're on insulin and you're trying to trying to reverse it or put it in remission yeah i have an aneurysm so would that help with that 
Well, the aneurysm's a weak spot, so it's not gonna, that's not a, cl a cl clogging. So it would just help by re reducing your blood pressure and having less stress on the body. So, you, so the aneurysm would be less likely to, to pop and bleed, so to speak. I have low pressure, but my doctor said I, it was be, I had that because of atherosclerosis that precipitated the aneurysm. Is it? Yeah, so, it's a, so it's a weak spot. Yeah, so an aneurysm is a weak spot in the blood vessel that bulges out like a balloon, basically is what an aneurysm is. So, so having injured stiff arteries can break down the, break down the artery and make it more likely to weaken, weaken the wall of it and bulge out. Yeah, I would, uh, I would do as close to Esselstyn as um, possible. Um, I, I, how close are you doing it or how far away are you? from it uh, from doing what he says yeah well like i'm doing uh uh three half three half cups of greens cooked greens i was going to ask you uh, a cup of greens is that cooked greens or raw greens so uh that's cooked greens that's a lot of greens <laughs> yeah i think it's raw yeah okay yeah like i said i'm doing three three half cup cooks, so I guess I'm doing half of what he recommends. I, I think that that's probably good. You know, he usually I, says a fistful. You think of a fistful six times a day is what he always talks about, having a size yeah. of your fist amount of greens six times a day. <laughs> yeah, I had been eating, you know, I'm trying to gain weight. And uh, so I had been eating nuts and avocados and, and sunflower and pumpkin seeds to I'm trying to eat 2,500 calories. It's hard to do that on fruits and vegetables without having some fat in there. Uh, so rather than the nuts and seeds, eating beans and lentils and potatoes. Yeah, three times a day, I've been having a, a quarter of a cup of raw, uh, like quinoa or brown rice and a half can of uh, beans. So I eat quite a bit. How many That's, beans do you eat for the day? Uh, one half, or uh, it'd be uh, one half, 16 ounce, 15 ounce cans. One half is like a one, serving? One, one and a half. I eat half a can each meal. Oh, you do? Okay, well, that's pretty good. Along, hey. with, along with the, uh, you know, uh, I take a quarter of a cup of, uh, either brown rice or quinoa right now and cook that. And that's, I have that with each, each uh, meal. Are you maintaining your weight with that? Actually, I gained, I'm starting to gain a couple pounds back. I'd lost quite a bit of weight. Good deal. Okay, Beth, did you go to sleep yet? Uh, it's on the East Coast. No, I'm uh, getting there though. Okay. Um, what was the name of the speaker who uh, you said talks about willpower? McGonagall, uh, M-C-G-O-N-I-G-A-L, McGonagall. Okay, thank you. Kelly McGonagall, M-C, capital G-O-N. I think I-G-A-L, something like that. And willpower. Anybody else? So let's see, we're here, we're here, and we're here. Uh, anybody have any questions? Any of the new people, any of the older people? It's going once, going twice, whatever. Yeah, they got the new gal that was here earlier. She's not here anymore. I, was, I could have showed her the website. But... It's like she's not here anymore. Yeah, I think she took off. I have another question. Okay, Beth. Is there anything on the website that has recipes for an Instapot, you know, whole food plant based? Yeah, there's a there's a cookbook on there I can show you. For okay, I mean, I don't mind looking it up. That's great. Oh, yeah, no. well, it's, it's good to, I like to show it just to give people a refresher 
Let me go. Here we go. You can see my screen, right? Yep. So if you go to uh, resources, hover over, you can click on resources or hover over, go to each specific thing, but here's links to cookbooks. And then there's actually one, there's a bunch of them here, but the one, there's actually one for Instapot. Uh, a whole cookbook on slow cooker and a whole cookbook on instant pot. And uh, this is the links to buy it on Amazon. We don't, of course, Charlie and I don't have any financial ties to any of this stuff. It's just cookbooks that we've used and like, and it's just for convenience, a, a link to pick it up. But yeah, there's a whole instant pot plant-based cookbook. I've tried quite a few of the recipes in here. They're really, really good actually. And so for that question specifically, yeah. And then there's some other, a few recipes on the recipe website. Um, some holiday recipes. There's just some ones that people have shared from the classes. This is, these are a bunch of recipes from the potluck we had back in 2019 before, before with the pandemic. And then a link, and then these are some other recipes here. And then we also have um, recipes that were, are uh, online. Let me see here. Recipe websites, let's see, I have it under resources. Yeah, here we go, recipe websites. And then here's just some of the links to different um, websites that have plant-based recipes. Because you definitely wanna, it's good to ask that because you, you don't wanna just necessarily search under vegan recipes because a lot of the vegan recipes will have a lot of oil and salt added a lot of times. So you wanna definitely want whole food plant-based resources so that you keep the oils out. Thank you. And then, you're welcome. Then under videos here, I'll show you, there's that Kelly McGonigal one. So you, it's that one on how to make stress your friend. That's here. You can check that out too. All right. Really good resources on the website, Scott. Thank you so much. It's great to be All able right. to go there and you know just see which ones you guys think are reliable. Because there's good. a bunch yeah, thank out there you. that you look at and you think, nah, I got a bunch of stuff I don't want. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. It's good. You have you guys have screened them for us and smoothed the path. We appreciate it. Yeah, welcome. Right. Well, um, looks like we're good for tonight, unless there is uh, anyone else who wants to add anything to the conversation. And next week, you said it's on uh, kidney disease, chronic kidney disease. That's correct. Okay. I have well, one announcement. Okay, go for it, Hank. Yeah, tomorrow is Dolly's birthday. She'll be 75. <laughs> oh. All right. Yay. Happy birthday. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, Dolly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Happy birthday, Dolly. Happy birthday. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> Go ahead, Doug, Abby. Dr. Esselstyn's book, I think, was copyright, like around 2004. Do you know if he's uh, amended anything in the, from the, the original book, anything over the years? I have not seen anything. No. Okay, thank you. Have a great day, Dolly. Okay. Birthday to you. Bye. Thank you very yeah. much. All right. I have a good good week everybody. Yep. Take care.